I've spoken about the weirdos that came out of the Cambrian before, and there seems to be a bit of a misconception that things got gradually more and more normal, with even prehistoric animals like dinosaurs having some sort of resemblance to today's creatures. Smack bang in the middle of the Paleozoic, we see quite the contrary. The Carboniferous was most certainly a strange time, with the biggest creepy crawlies in Earth's history scuttling and flying around the place. These animals at least look like animals we're familiar with, just scaled up. But swimming around was something that those bugs would have called a living fossil, and what we humans have fondly called the Tully Monster. In 1955, amateur fossil hunter Francis Tully was prospecting along the Maison Creek formation in Illinois when he came across the first specimen of this animal. But the paleontologists were completely stumped as to what to make of it. It wasn't actually described until 1966, being named Tully Monstrum Gregarium. This roughly translates to Tully's common monster, referencing not only its strange, monstrous nature, but also the relative abundance that this creature eventually showed. But despite the publication, scientists were completely stumped as to its taxonomic placement, and you can see why. Tully Monstrum appears to have been a long, somewhat worm-like animal measuring at around 35 centimetres or 14 inches long, with a pair of ventral fins on what appears to be the tail end of the body. Going along the body, we see some sort of transverse bar, which could have sat either on top of or projected either side of the body, which ended in two round organs being typically interpreted as eyes. Though the head itself is poorly defined, we see it ends in what is the biggest callback to Cambrian arthropods, a proboscis. This grabby appendage had a level of flexibility which is highly debated, but it ended with a set of quote-unquote jaws lined with small sharp teeth. Now its relative abundance is a weird one, because no specimen has preserved any discernible hard parts, be it bone, chitin or calcium carbonate. The only exception here is the possible presence of a notochord, which we'll get back into in a sec after determining what we do know about the creature. Tully Monstrum was found in the Maison Creek Formation of Illinois where it would serve as the state fossil, which was laid down during the late Carboniferous between 311 and 306 million years ago. And plenty was happening, as I explained here, but in the water, life had now fully recovered following the Devonian extinction, with this formation showing plenty of anemones, cephalopods, crustaceans, arrow and sea worms, clams, shrimps, snails, sea scorpions, and bony and cartilaginous fish. Judging from what we can go on, Tully Monstrum was a free-swimming carnivore in the water's upper column, since it often washed ashore where it would preserve, using its jawed proboscis to pick up smaller creatures and detritus. So its place in this ancient world is fairly easy to surmise, but its placement taxonomically is a very different story. Now this isn't a case of deciding whether this was a worm or an arthropod, we can't even decide on whether this was a vertebrate or not. On one hand, morphological features such as keratinous teeth, very vertebrate-like eyes containing melanosomes only seen in vertebrates, and a structure that very much resembles the notochord seems to point to the vertebrate direction. A notochord is a rod of nerves that would eventually evolve into a full spinal cord and is present in all chordates, which includes vertebrates as well as a few groups that lack an internal skeleton but still possess this rod. Even if the Tully monster lacked an internal skeleton, the presence of this notochord suggests an animal that has a very basal relation to all vertebrates, even if it technically isn't one. But on the other hand, the vertebrate-like melanosomes that were preserved in the eyes resemble chemical traces left by many other animals that are invertebrates, such as cuttlefish. On top of this, the supposed notochord seems to extend beyond the eyes, which does not happen with chordates, as well as the apparent brain that may have been present not being connected to the eyes. And if this was a vertebrate, then it's the only one in history that we know of that was an Opabinia fanboy when it came to feeding. Plus, it's hardly like fins, complex eye stalks, and possible brains were limited to vertebrates, as showcased by the anomalocarids. These debates are going on to this day, and despite the incredible preservational potential of this formation, they're likely to continue, since even the best specimens of Tully Monstrum seem to provide only more confusion. Well, actually tell a lie, it also provided some amusement in the late 60s, when paleontologist Brian Patterson sent fake letters under various aliases to the guy that described the Tully Monstrum, Eugene Richardson, in which he claimed that there was talk of a modern representative deep within the lakes of Kenya, known as the Dancing Worms of Turkana, which produced milk and could kill a man in a single bite. Richardson planned a whole expedition out to Kenya to see it for himself, 
but cancelled it after Patterson disclosed the prank in a Christmas letter, which thankfully was taken in good humour. Other than that, that's unfortunately where we're at with regards to the Tully monster. We have no idea what it actually looks like properly in life, or even what phylum to put it in. Only that it was a weird convergent callback to a time in which life on our planet got really experimental. And let me know what you think of the Tully monster as to how you would classify it whilst I answer today's question, which comes from... Alfred Waldo 6097, who's asked... What is your favourite idiacaran animal living thing. So for those that don't know, the Ediacaran biota refers to the first somewhat consistent fossils in Earth's history, in reference to their timing being the Ediacaran period, just before the Cambrian. The Cambrian is famous for being the first relatively fossil-rich period, but the Ediacaran did it first. It's just that much of the fossils found from this time are rare, tiny, and slash or difficult to determine. To give you an idea, these consisted of organisms resembling embryos, quills, discs, sacs, and some microscopic shells. Many of these organisms create confusion on a bigger taxonomic scale than even the Tully monster, since not many can even agree on whether these are animals or not. When it comes to my favourite, I'm tempted to say Dickinsonia, just because it's the most iconic and evocative of the Ediacaran confusion, but that also seems like a bit of an obvious choice to those in the know. So I would also say Spragina, since it offers a potential look into how arthropods might have gotten their starts, as well as possibly being one of the earliest known predators, or pseudo-rhizostomites. Because, well, well, I'm immature and it makes me chuckle. If I'm going to be honest, my main justification for making any Ediacaran biota my favourite is its weirdness and mystery surrounding it. In which case we could be here all day. So if you can think of an answer regarding Tully Monstrum, then why not let me know down below what your favourite would be, after which I would kindly ask that you leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, so I can catch you guys next time.